Good morning, everyone, and uh, welcome to this morning's Ask ICAST webinar. Uh, I do hope that you're all having a good week so far and that you've been managing to at least make some use of the limited lifting of lockdown restrictions. We already have uh, quite a number of people on the webinar already, uh, well over uh, 120 or so uh, joining us at the moment. Um, but we do have quite a full and packed webinar to get through. So I'm sure anyone who's slightly late in joining us just now will be able to join us during uh, the general preliminaries that we go through just now in the introduction. Uh, so rather than waiting any further, we'll really just uh, move on uh, on this webinar. So this weekly series of Ask ICAST webinars gives members an opportunity to find out more and ask questions from the in-house experts at ICAST on a range of topics. I'm David Mingus, Director of Practice here at ICAST, and I'll be guiding you through this webinar. I do unfortunately just have to uh, mention that the webinar does uh, provide general commentary on matters and shouldn't be relied upon as definitive in relation to the aspects covered. It is inevitable that we tend to be talking about current topics and where situations and guidance are continuing to develop. As always, we'd expect our members to use their own professional judgment and seek other appropriate professional or legal advice where that's appropriate. Normally during May and June, uh, the tax team within ICAS are out and about on the roads across the UK delivering our annual spring tax update roadshows. Obviously with the COVID environment, that's not possible uh, this year. So the Spring Tax uh, Update Roadshots have the opportunity to bring members up to date with developments in the tax world affecting both individuals and corporates. In this webinar, we're going to have a look at the taxation of business, and this is part two of our Spring Tax Update. Taking you through the detail and answering your questions alongside me will be two of my tax colleague experts from within ICAST. I'm delighted to be joined this morning by Susan Cattell, ICAS's Head of Tax Technical Policy. Susan is Secretary to the ICAS International and Large Business Tax Committee, as well as the ICAS Private Client Committee. She also works uh, on the Indirect Tax Committee within ICAS. Susan is based in the southeast of England and is therefore ideally located to meet with uh, HM Treasury and HMRC officials in London and she represents ICAS on various HMRC groups, including, including the Compliance Reform Forum and the Joint VAT Consultative Committee. I'm also pleased to be joined by Philip McNeil, Head of Tax, who looks after particularly practice and owner-managed businesses taxes. Philip is based down in uh, rural Dumfrieshire and is Secretary to the ICAS Owner-Managed Business Tax Committee. He works on tax issues that affect small and medium-sized practitioners and their clients, as well as SMEs. And recent work has included helping members and their clients dealing with making tax digital for VAT. And he has also been heavily involved in work with HMRC, improving the way H they interact with the agents. But before I hand over to Susan to kick things off, just obviously a few housekeeping matters to, uh, to remind you of. We've had one or two questions uh, already submitted in advance, uh, but obviously questions can be submitted using the Q&A bubbles uh, at the bottom of your screen. Uh, so please submit those at any time during the course of the webinar. The questions are only uh, viewable to myself, Susan and Philip, uh, and we won't identify uh, who questions come from. So please uh, don't feel shy about any asking any of the questions. I'm sure that many of you joining us will have questions around COVID-19 issues and particularly around uh, the job retention scheme. However, this webinar is more of a general tax update. And while we're happy for questions on those to be submitted, it's most likely I would suggest that we'll respond to those offline and include uh, issues particularly around COVID-19 in the Q&A document, which will go along the slides and the recording of this webinar on ICAST.com. We will be covering um, the job retention scheme and other updates uh, in relation to COVID-19 business support issues in a future webinar in a couple of weeks' time. We are recording this webinar and it will be available for on-demand viewing afterwards in case you want to refer back to it or indeed share it with others. Everyone on the webinar is automatically muted, so uh, obviously with lots of people working at home, there's no need to be concerned about any of the background noise wherever you are. So, Without further ado, uh, we'll hand over to Susan uh, to start off the, the Spring Tax Update. Over to you, Susan. Right. 
Um, well, good morning, everybody, and welcome to part two of the ICAS Spring Tax Update. And as David says, today we're going to talk about the taxation of businesses. Um, if you missed part one, which was the taxation of individuals, then there is a recording available on the ICAS website if you want to go back and look at that. Um, just looking at the first slide, um, Aha, there it is. Just looking at the first slide, um, I'm really sorry that we're obviously not meeting face to face in London, which is where I would normally be running this session. However, we're always interested to hear from ICAST tax members in London or anywhere else in the country. And if you look on that slide, there is a link to the ICAST tax team webpage on ICAST.com and you'll find all of our contact details there so do go and have a look at that because if you've got any views on open consultations or if you're having any particular problems with hmrc um, as david says we meet with hmrc regularly and hm treasury so do do let us know via, via email if you have any issues right starting off with today's session if we could move to the next slide please um yeah thank you um we're hoping that this is a one-off because some of you may remember that a few years ago, Philip Hammond decided that we would only have one fiscal event per year, which is really good news because it means you can have a sensible policy cycle with consultation working its way through to legislation. And this year, uh, so and the one single fiscal event was going to be an autumn budget. And Philip Hammond stuck to that. But unfortunately, last year's autumn budget was delayed because of a combination of Brexit and then the general election. So instead of having an autumn budget, the UK budget didn't happen until the 11th of March 2020. And that caused some problems for the Scottish governments because normally they would expect to see the UK budget, which obviously has an impact on things like partially devolved taxes. And before they do their own budget. But this year, the Scottish budget came first. You'll see the dates are on the slide. And today I'm going to concentrate on things that are relevant to corporate taxes. And I'm particularly going to pick up some things that were announced in the UK budget and some things that are in the finance bill, which was published a week later. Now, some of the legislation we had seen before because it was some of it was published in draft last July. Now, the Finance Act is expected to get royal assent in July or possibly slightly later. We don't have a precise date. So if we could move on to the next slide. Um, first thing I'm going to talk about is corporate taxes. Um, or rather I'm, I'm going to talk mostly about corporate taxes, but I've got a number of things on the next slide, please. The first one being the corporation tax rate, which is going to remain at 19% from April 2020. And I'm sure most of you will remember that this was supposed to reduce to 17%. And in fact, that 17% rate was actually put into legislation in Finance Act 2016. And that's why we have to have a clause in the current finance bill to reduce that rate to 17%. Um, sorry, to, not to reduce it, to freeze it at 19% rather than reducing it to 17%. It's also been set at 19% for the financial year 2021. Now, this wasn't a great surprise to anybody because Boris Johnson said last year at the CBI conference in November that if the Tory party was elected in the general election, they would put this reduction in rate on hold in order to help fund national priorities, including the NHS. And it's interesting to note that the Treasury impact assessment for this measure estimated that it would raise £4.6 billion in the first year, rising to £7.5 billion a year from 24 to 25. So you can see it's going to keep raising that certain amount of money for the government. Um, it has to be said that even though the rate cut hasn't gone ahead, 19% is still the lowest rate in the G, lowest corporate tax rate in the G20. So it's not as though um, the UK is putting a particularly high corporate tax rate in place. Now, if we move on, you'll see that, um, uh, sorry, no previous slide. Um, you'll see that there were two movements in the other direction because the structures and buildings allowance which was only introduced in um, 2018 has actually been increased it was introduced at two percent which means that it would take you 50 years to write off the expenditure on the commercial building or structure that you were claiming the allowance for but it's now been increased to three percent so it will only take you 33 and a third years to write off the expenditure on the commercial building or structure that you built. Notice it does not apply to residential properties and that hasn't changed. The other 
increase, increase in a relief was the research and development credits. Again, this was announced in the budget and it's now in the finance bill. And the RDEC credits are being increased from 12% to 13%. Now they were only introduced at 20, in 2013 when they were 10% and they've risen steadily since then to 11%, then 12% in 2015, uh, sorry, 12% in 2018. And now they're going to go to 13%. Now, the RDEC credits are mostly relevant to large companies. Um, there, there, a few SMEs can claim RDEC on certain types of expenditure, primarily subsidised expenditure or for R&D contracted to them by a large company. But otherwise, RDECs are mostly relevant to large companies. And Philip's going to pick up some R&D aspects relevant to SMEs in his section of the presentation later on. The last thing I want to talk about on this slide is the amendment to the quarterly instalment payment rules for very large companies and those of you who came on the spring tax update in London last year will remember that we did talk about the change in the rules for very large companies because the normal CT due date is nine months and one day after the end of an accounting period but large companies that is broadly companies with profits of more than 1.5 million have for many years had to pay their taxes earlier than that they have to pay quarterly instalments starting in month seven of a 12-month accounting period and what happened last April was that very large companies and that's broadly companies with profits of more than 20 million and tax of more than 10,000 pounds their instalment payments were moved earlier still so from last April very large companies were paying their corporation tax in months three six nine and twelve so by the end of the accounting period they will have paid all the tax due for that accounting period now, this had an unexpected consequence because there are, uh, there are some companies who are not generally speaking, they don't generally have a source liable to corporation tax, but if they sell an asset and they have a chargeable gain, it will trigger an immediate one day accounting period so that they can pay the tax on that chargeable gain. And the problem with that is that the 20 million threshold is reduced if you have a small accounting, a short accounting period. It's also reduced if you're part of a group. But a, 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 lot, a company which has a gain, and the gain could now be as small as 54,795 because of the reduction in the 20 million threshold, and they would be caught as being a lot, very large company. And the tax could be as low as £27.40. So the result of the change in April last year was that these companies of the one day accounting period would suddenly find that they had to pay all the tax on that chargeable gain immediately on the day of the accounting period. And clearly that wasn't the intention of the legislation and it's not particularly fair. So apparently HMRC has been operating a concession since last April, whereby these companies don't have to pay until three months and 14 days after the end of the accounting period. And HMRC achieved that by treating them as large rather than very large for the purposes of the quarterly instalment payment rules. And what's happening in the finance bill is that that's being legislated. So going forward, you, nobody will have to rely on a concession. It will be in the legislation. Okay, if we could move on to the next slide, please. Um, we've already mentioned that the corporate tax rate is not reducing to 17%, it's staying at 19%. Now, some large companies who have also had various re reliefs restricted in recent years, so they've had their interest relief restricted, they've had their trading loss set off restricted. And now as well as not getting a reduction in the main rate, they're also going to have a further restriction. Um, the their corporate capital losses are going to be restricted. This was originally announced in the autumn budget of 2018. Um, it's taking effect for accounting periods beginning on or after 1st of April 2020. Although, as you'll see on the slide, there are some transitional rules. So if you have an accounting period straddling 1st of April 2020, um, you, you need to, it will apply to you slightly sooner. You need to go and have a look at the rules. And there are also some anti forestalling provisions. Um, ICAS has responded to two consultations on this. You'll see there's a link to the most recent response on, on the slide. Um, the effect of this restriction is that the amount of carried forward capital losses a company can offset is restricted to 50% of chargeable gains arising in a later accounting period. And I'm sure some of you will recognise that that's very similar to the restriction on the set off of carried forward trading losses that was put in place in 2017. Um, 
there is a maximum deduction allowance, deductions allowance of five million. And that um, does mean that a lot of small companies won't be affected by this because they won't be anywhere near that five million threshold. So they won't actually have their losses restricted. Um, the problem is that um, you'll see from the slide that that five million deductions allowance is going to be shared between the chargeable gains and the trading um, aspect of the restriction and that means that the legislation is going to be incredibly complicated to apply and one of the things that we said in our response to the consultation was in fact we said that there should be a separate deductions allowance for capital gains and for trading because that would have made the computation slightly simpler not a lot simpler but slightly simpler and unfortunately that wasn't taken up um, one thing however that was taken up which a lot of people were asking for that was that there are now some special rules for companies in insolvent liquidation and they are allowed to offset their carried forward losses against gains without any restriction during the liquidation period. Now that, that does make sense because the government's reasoning behind this restriction and the restriction on trading loss set off was because they said that some very large companies were still making profits, but because they'd got carried forward losses from many years ago, the government wasn't getting any tax. So, but of course a company in insolvent liquidation isn't going to be making any profits so it makes sense to have that let that that um that relaxation for them the other thing to watch out for is if you're dealing with certain other types of company there are some special rules to take into account and that includes life insurers real estate investment trusts companies with ring fence trades and companies with one day accounting periods like the ones we were talking about um in the context of quarterly installment payments Oh, and one other thing that you should watch out for, I, I mentioned that a lot of small companies will not be affected by this because of the um, 5 million deductions allowance. However, um, when, when we had the trading loss restriction, a lot of small companies therefore thought that they could just ignore this, that it had nothing to do with them and they could just forget about it. And unfortunately, that wasn't the case because there were some requirements to make entries on your corporate tax return about your deductions allowance and one or two other things and we assume that that's going to continue with this capital loss restriction as well although HMRC haven't yet issued the guidance on what's going to be required on the corporation tax returns but it's very important that you do keep an eye open for that and don't just assume that because you're well below that 500, 5 million limit that you can just ignore this because if they do put requirements in about what you need to put on the return and you don't do it you could lose your losses so do keep an eye on that one right second thing on this slide intangible fixed assets on budget day this year this looked as though this was going to be a really huge announcement um, because it was it was the summary that appeared on budget day said that basically the, that we were going to remove the restrictions preventing companies claiming tax relief on older intellectual property and that there would be one regime um, for uh, for intangible assets for uh for intangible assets acquired from 1st of july 2020 um, and of course the reason why you would want assets to come within the intangible fixed assets regime rather than staying in the pre-fao 2002 capital gains regime is that if you're in in the intangibles regime you can get a deduction for amortization or um, straight line depreciation whichever is appropriate uh, now, the problem is that when we got the small print on this, it turned out that it was nothing like as huge as those budget day summaries had suggested. <laughs> um, because first of all, there's a huge exclusion because any transfer within a UK CG group, so that is a group within section 171 TCGA 1992, that's excluded. So it's not going to be all intangible assets acquired from related parties because anything that's going on within a UK capital gains group is excluded. Um, the other thing is that there are some transitional anti-avoidance rules, which mean that you do not get any deductions for what are called restricted assets. Now, they're quite complicated, so I'm not going to go into the details here. But what it means is it takes out quite a few more of the, trans the, the, the acquisitions that might have qualified. Um, the, the main beneficiaries of this legislation are therefore probably going to be very large multinational groups where they're holding the IP in one of the overseas companies and they want to bring that onshore to the UK. Um, obviously, that because of all these anti-avoidance rules, you do still need to look at the details very carefully. Right, moving on to the next slide. 
Um, digital services tax. Now, again, some of you may remember this, this has been floating around for quite a while because it was originally announced in the autumn 2018 budget that the UK would unilaterally impose a digital services tax for an interim period until an international agreement could be reached. Um, and the, the, the reason why the UK and, and in fact lots of other countries are considering imposing a digital services tax is that the system for tax, the international system of taxation hasn't really caught up with the digital age. So the international tax system is largely based around physical presence. Whereas, of course, if you think of all the big companies, uh, huge multinationals now, a lot of them are in the digital arena. And if you just move your eyes slightly down the slide, you'll see that the UK's digital services tax is going to apply to groups providing search engines, social media platforms and online marketplaces. And that type of business is something that the digital tax system hasn't really got to grips with. Now, the OECD is looking at trying to get some kind of international agreement on how those sorts of businesses should be taxed in future, because they gain lots of income from users in all jurisdictions all around the world where they don't have a physical presence. And of course, a lot of those governments would like to get their hands on some of the, the, the some tax on the revenues from the citizens of their jurisdiction who are using these services. Um, ICAS has responded to two consultations on this and both those responses are on the website. Um, the Chancellor confirmed that the UK's DST would be introduced from 1st of April 2020. I've already mentioned the groups that it's going to apply to. It's only going to apply to very large multinational groups and it's because it's only where the group receives 500 million of revenue from the relevant activity, of which 25 million is from UK users. And the UK's DST will be a 2% tax on the revenues derived from those UK users. There is an alternative charge, a method of charge in limited circumstances where the UK operating margin is very low. And of course that highlights one of the problems with digital services taxes because often, they're, as in the UK case, they're based on revenues, not on profits. Now, you can probably imagine that the main targets of um, the, the digital services tax, the, 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 most, the companies who are most likely to be pay, ending up paying these are largely US corporations. And so some of you may have seen that in the last few days, the US have opened an investigation into the UK's digital services tax and, and the digital services taxes that are either proposed or are already being legislated by quite a number of other countries. Just, uh, just a few of them include Italy, Spain, Turkey, Brazil, the Czech Republic, and there are some others. And the problem with that is that um, the US ran an investigation like this into France last year because the French had legislated a digital services tax. And the outcome of that was that the US felt that it was discriminating against their corporations. And they therefore threatened that, that they would impose 100% tariffs on things like champagne and French cheese. So the review into the that the US are now conducting into the UK digital services tax might come up with some similar conclusions. And in fact, the French have deferred implementing their tax until the end of this year in the hope that um, the OECD is going to come up with an international agreement. And until very recently, the OECD, it looked as if quite good progress was being made and that they might have some concrete proposals that people would agree to by the end of this year. Sadly, in the last couple of weeks, there have been some reports that they are in fact now struggling to reach agreement because some, the US don't like some aspects of the OECD's proposals and China and some various tax havens don't like some of the other aspects. So I think we have to keep our fingers crossed because one of the big problems if lots and lots of jurisdictions introduce their own unilateral DSTs like the UK one is that first of all it's a huge compliance burden because they'll all be slightly different and secondly there's a huge possibility of double taxation and then a great deal of difficulty getting arbitration between the jurisdictions to try and eliminate that. So I think we have to hope that there will be some progress on finding a new basis for an international approach. Of course, if that does happen, um, and then that's enacted, and you'll see on the slide that the UK government's committed to review progress by 2025 and to report back to Parliament, I think we have to hope that they get there slightly sooner than that. But that won't be, still won't be a win-win, if you like, for the multinational companies affected, because having put in place quite what will be quite onerous procedures to be able to report on how many users they've got in a particular jurisdiction and to allocate the revenue to those users, 
if the international approach will, will almost certainly will be different they'll have to then put in place a whole new set of procedures to meet the to, to comply with whatever the new international internationally agreed regimes are and the one other thing i wanted to mention on this the treasury impact assessment for the digital services tax um, said that it wouldn't have any direct impact on households and individuals, which is clearly true because no individual or household is going to be paying the digital services tax. But it is, of course, clear that, that they, there will be an impact. And I mean, there is widespread um, public support for taxing people like Google and Amazon. But I think it's a mistake to think that that then won't have any impact on anyone else, because, of course, any big platform is, is going to look at reclawing re back the money from somewhere that they have to pay on these taxes and the obvious way is to pay charge their users for subscriptions or to increase the charges for using online marketplaces and so on. So um, I think it's worth noting that, that there will be some impact on wider society. Okay, can we move on to the next slide, please? This was something else that was announced on Budget Day and the consultation was published on Budget Day. Um, it's something that the Chancellor's planning to legislate in Finance Bill 2020 to 21. And it's the proposal is that there will be a requirement for large businesses, corporates, partnerships and LLPs to notify HMRC where they've adopted an uncertain tax treatment. And broadly, an uncertain tax treatment is one where the business believes HMRC may not agree with their interpretation of legislation, case law or guidance. And as you can see from the limits on the slide, this is very large businesses. Um, ICAS is going to respond to this. Um, if any of you want to go and look at the con consultation and email us your views, we'd be very interested to hear about it. And don't be misled by the fact that it looks as though the consultation ends in May. It doesn't. It, the deadline's been extended to August. Um, we've already discussed this with, this with the ICAS Large Business and International Committee. And I think um, our main concerns are that this could be incredibly onerous and it's also not clear what HMRC hopes to get out of it because the vast majority of large businesses are already very cooperative with HMRC. They have what are called customer compliance managers and they work very closely with them. And the feedback we have from our members is that, I mean, they're very anxious to tell that, to discuss any possible uncertain treatments with their um, CCM because they don't want uncertainty. And so we're, we're slightly concerned that this, what could be quite an onerous requirement, might be imposed on everybody when what HMRC is really worried about is a very small number of uncooperative companies. Um, and judging from something that HMRC said back in 2015, when, the, when they started a programme of trying to improve compliance with large, com large businesses, it could be, you know, as few as the four or five companies that they're really worried about. And we, it will be very interesting to see how this progresses. And I say, do let us have your views if you have any. Right, moving on to the next slide, I just want to say a few words about two aspects of making tax digital. Um, Philip's going to pick up making tax digital in, in general. But um, firstly, I wanted to say on MTD for VAT, we're no longer hearing about any significant problems with the VAT filing. So for those people who've been mandated and have now signed up, as far as we know, it's going quite well. The teething problems have been sorted out. If you are still having problems, do drop us an email. We do talk to HMRC regularly. You'll see from those figures on the slide that not everybody who was mandated to sign up for MTD has actually done so. We do know that HMRC are planning some compliance interventions, but they've put it on hold because of COVID-19. The other thing to note that there was a, is that there was a soft landing period because in addition to filing, which um, you, you would already have had to have done for mandation, there was... Um, there's also a requirement to have full digital links between any accounting programs and software packages that that you use um, for uh, compiling your VAT return and keeping your VAT accounts. And the that that one year soft landing period would have run out in either April or October 2020. But because of COVID-19, HMRC have extended it to April 2021. 
But if you think you're still going to have trouble meeting that, and I know there are some very large corporates and people like local authorities who might have 40 or 50 accounting systems that they need to get to talk to each other. If you think you may still have a problem, go and have a look at the VAT notice because you'll see that a business can formally apply for a specific direction for an extension. Now, it, it's really important that you go and do that fairly soon because you do need to supply evidence to HMRC, you need to talk to them, you need to supply them with evidence of when you will be able to do it if you can't meet the actual deadline so don't leave it till 31st of March because they're likely to turn you down if you do that but um, if you think you might still have a problem do have a look but be aware that I mean HMRC are expecting people to keep working on this so they're probably going to be quite tough about it and making tax digital for corporation tax well I'm afraid this is a bit of a non-announcement because um, we know it's not going to happen in 2020 because of the announcement last year but we've been expecting a consultation to be published ever since informal discussions with HMRC in 2017 and we were definitely expecting it at the end of last year and it still hasn't appeared so we'll have to wait and see what happens on that but keep your eyes open because that, before it can be implemented there will be a consultation and a pilot. Um, if we just move to the next slide now in fact um, and the next one please I'm not actually going to talk about these two slides because I can see that I need to hand over to Philip so that he can tell you about SMEs um, so can I just draw your attention this was only a reminder because we covered this last year so can I suggest that you do have a look at these two slides and just make sure that if you're affected by this you you have a you, you take a good look at the requirements because it's now been enacted in UK legislation, so it's not immediately affected by Brexit or anything. And the first reporting deadlines are coming up, although, as you'll see on the second slide, they may be deferred slightly. I mean, if anybody's got any questions about it, please do type them in and we'll try and pick them up either at the end or afterwards. And otherwise, as I say, I recommend that you have a look at the slides later and just double check whether you're affected. And now I'm going to hand over to Philip to talk about SMEs. Right, well, good morning, everyone. Um, welcome to the OMB section. Um, taking our first slide, it seems um, ages ago since the, the finance bill um, happened. I mean, March seems like worlds away with all the, um, the crisis that's intervened. And I think what one wants to do at this stage and what I'm aiming to do is just take a, uh, an overview of some of the features of the, the finance bill that might impact us and just highlight and draw together this diverse mix of the, the, the COVID-19 and the, the, the finance bill and the consultations and see what, if we put them together, might, might impact you now. So first of all, finance bill, we're going to look at structures and buildings allowance, we'll look at R&D and, and we're starting with what entrepreneurs relief. Now, Headline and detail. I think this is what it's all about. There's a, there's a broad brush and one could say um, the headline rate, you know, the, the annual um, lifetime limit has gone down from 10 million to 1 million. So that's brilliant. Tick the box, move on. But unfortunately, we're left with even more complexity and masses of detail. And I just wanted to bring a couple of things to your intention. Two dates, 11th of March 2020, which is the date from which the, the change in the, the, the annual allowance happens, and when we get these anti forestalling measures introduced, and 6th of April, where we have this renaming of Entrepreneurs Relief as BADA, Business Asset Disposal Relief. Um, and really the issue there is that its name doesn't really reflect any better than entrepreneurs relief what it actually does. I mean, the, the issue here is it is still about business disposal. And I think the thing I would like to highlight to you is that these anti forestalling precisions will catch ordinary transactions. And particularly if you have anything in view that's happened anywhere through the last um, 12 months, look out for unconditional contracts for sale and, sh and share exchanges. Um, these are the sorts of conditions where you might have rolled over the gain um, on, a, on a family, you know, on a, on a, on a, a management buyout or um, a, a succession in a family company. And normally you would have made an, a, a, an election to bring that chain into tax where that was 
sensible because the the person selling the shares or you know the exchanging the shares was would, would have lost their on their entrepreneurs relief um in the future you know their, their holding was falling below, below the five percent limits so if that happens during this year the election would have to have gone in before you know on budget day at the latest not as one would normally do um along with a tax return later on in the year so if you have any of those transactions be very careful very wide-ranging um impact um similarly don't forget we've got all these complex rules that still apply on the five percent the two-year holding and when i say complex market value what I'm, what I'm referring to there's that last one where it says um you can still get entrepreneurs relief if you are entitled to five percent of the market value of all the ordinary shares at that date um, so really what I'm saying is do a file review and, and um, make sure that we don't fall foul of these, the, these new changes. So if we move on to the, the next item on our agenda, um, research and development. I mean, Susan's already mentioned the, the, the Red X change. Welcome news to some degree for the larger firms, but that's just a peg to hang on the changes for the SMEs. SME changes really, um, looking forwards to next april people might want to accelerate r d claims in, in all, you know in, in, to, to improve their cash flow but we're looking at two barriers and one of these is that there is going to be a cap on r d of three times the pay as you earn in national insurance plus 20k if you haven't looked at the detail of that just check it out it could still change because the consultation is still underway and we have until august to make representations um, this was all part of a package of anti-avoidance measures possibly because there is a relatively small number of people um, manipulating the system essentially by doing either imp imprecise or inaccurate claims um, following on from that all regulated practitioners need to be aware of how we interact with what might be um, specialist r d providers or unregulated r d um, advisors that there is new professional um, conduct in relation to tax guidance that says look just watch out be careful in this area if you're supplying information to someone who you know is is going to use that in a return or if you're submitting a tax return on behalf of someone who has used a firm that you're not sure about you you have obligations and, and look at pcrt as being an advantage it will keep you the right side of the line you can go back to your client and say look this is how we have to treat this because this is what the institute says okay so if we if we move on to the next the next topic structures and buildings allowance not a great deal to say but again it's complexity um 33 and a third isn't a brilliant number to to do all your computations on we still have um, a 3% allowance here, yet if you've got it in the plant of machinery, you've, you, you've potentially got a very, very much higher um, and faster return. So one thing I'd be interested here is, have you had claims? Has this plugged a, a gap? Um, is this something that's useful? What representation should we be making the government on this? Is it, is it a marginal idea or, or ha has this actually produced um, a business benefit? so that's enough on structures and buildings allowance if we look onto the next slide just so we reminder that we're we're still in the the range for construction changes one that you might not have seen again because the consultation is fairly um short you know a fairly short time scale and there's so much else going on is if you deal with limited company subcontractors the revenue is seeking a power due to come in next april where it will be able to amend EPS returns, the RTI returns, without any um, consultation. So that they will basically decide that they do not think there's enough evidence for a CIS figure on the return and they will disallow it. So be aware of that, um, build it in. Remember also that it's not the, um, you know, it, it is that, another anti-avoidance measure that's coming in will be the VAT reverse charge. So there's, a, there's potentially a lot of change coming in construction. Um, 
And what I would do is I'd recommend having a quick look through that consultation on, on industry scheme abuse. If you have anyone in that category um, where they are a limited company and they, you know, they have this set off of, of the CIS that, that, that they would be, um, they would normally be charged. So it's a limited area, but, but potentially a large, um, a large impact. One's basic feeling is it, it may be a sledgehammer cracking up, but everyone is then having to cope with a, with a regulation. So if we follow on from that to the next slide, um, let's move on to the areas of, of the, this COVID support. First headline issue is we do have some um, draft legislation now, and that's very helpful but it's a little bit of, a, of a, a mix. It's got in corporation tax and income tax and, and all the schemes in one. It's sometimes a little bit difficult to see what, what each bit is designed to do. What becomes clear is, um, talking about self-employed income support scheme, the, the focus is that will all be taxed on in 2021. So it, we're not looking at your normal trading basis periods. It doesn't matter what period it was received. We don't need to accrue it back to, to cover for a bit for March. Um, there is likely to be a separate box on the tax return. And also there is confirmation that all the other tax, you know, all the other COVID support is taxable. Don't forget that behind the scenes, this um, little clause being inserted and a schedule into the finance bill is really designed at penalties. It's designed at recovering it when people have got it wrong. So it will turn um, a, a payment of support, which shouldn't have been claimed, into a recoverable tax liability in year. And the revenue will have the power to raise assessment on that in year, even before you declared it on a tax return. So a very big change is all the self-employed income support scheme grants will have to go on a tax return in 2021. The, the job retention scheme essentially should net off, but be aware if the employer has claimed um, the scheme money when they should not have done, for example, if they furlough people for three weeks and, and then call some of the staff back in after two weeks, then they would not be entitled to claim it at all for that two week period. That would be an overpayment. Um, that would technically be something that then had to go on your tax return, be it the company return or be it the, um, the unincorporated business return to pay that money back to HMRC. If HMRC felt there'd been fraud, which there obviously is at some stages of the system, we're all aware that there, there, there are criminals out there trying to, trying to get advantage of these schemes, the revenue has the power to charge 100% penalties. And this is all recovered as tax. So quite a lot to, to consider there. Uh, and, and really what I would suggest is get the evidence now because revenue will do inquiry work on this but obviously this is going to be 12, 18 months down the line. You need to get your clients to have proof now that what they did in claiming these grants was appropriate. And for self-employed income support scheme, the key one is where are you trading in the relevant years? Where are you intending to trade in 2021? Does it make sense? If you're using the, 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 the job retention scheme, make sure you've fitted all the detailed conditions because if you get it wrong, the revenue may come knocking on your door. Other things to watch for, obviously, cash flow issues might have caused people to um, change their dividend policy or waive bonuses. Make, let's make sure we get it right. There are very detailed rules about how to do bonuses. If you waive it after the employee or the director has a legal right to the money, you're still going to find you're liable for the um, payers you earn a national insurance on that. So it will be treated as a payment of salary and then a gift back to the employer. That's not what we want to do. Similarly with dividends, if you don't get it right, A, the dividend could be illegal and B, in these circumstances, just watch you, you're going concerned, just watch that there are the distributable profits to cover that. You might need to change your remuneration strategy. Everyone likes to be generous, but gifts to charity, 
we're still under the old rules. Um, you know, if you are a company and you give services that isn't automatically covered simply because you give it to charity and it's a good cause, you, you need to use the gift aid scheme. It might involve making an outright gift of, of, of money and, and someone using that to buy in services. Gifts of goods are not the same as gifts of services. So it's specific schemes. Don't just think that anything that you've done that's a good idea that's, that, that, that's quotes charitable is going to get tax relief because it won't. Reconsider perhaps your cash basis elections, what you would do with tax losses. And, and let's be very cautious about this tax deferral. Um, there are provisions here where you can defer your, your, your income tax payments on account, your VAT for, for the quarter from March. We don't just want to be kicking the can down the road. Accountants are brilliant at being realistic. Let, let's take the emotion out of it, look at the situation realistically. Um, is this business viable? And I would say to you, the ones that restructure early are the ones who are going to live. So you might need to take some tough decisions fairly soon. Um, you might be asking your clients to take tough decisions. That would be valuable advice because it's going to mean that they're more likely to bounce back in the future and take into account the fact, yes, tax deferral is useful, but it's not the end. You will still end up with a bill and you will end up with a bill on your self-employed income support scheme and the grants because a thousand pounds to you in SEIS um, support, you are the basic rate taxpayer, you will then owe the government 290 pounds in tax and national insurance on that, 18 month delay until you pay it quite possibly, but factor that in, we want people to be viable, we want the business to come out the other end. So moving on to our next slide, and what do we expect in the budget? Well, I, I think I gave up predicting when I, I went to a public sector conference on VAT and it was publicly announced, the public sector MTD for VAT, they will be in, it will start in April. And lo and behold, within a month, it had been deferred to October. And since then, it's been de deferred in, indefinitely. Um, it's not a time for us to be saying definitely A will happen or B will happen, but let's be realistic. Um, there needs to be a trade-off and this virus impact has shown us that some areas like your close company um, taxation, they've been left out, many of the owner managed businesses have been left out from um, the virus support, the COVID support, because either there wasn't up-to-date information on the business, so we go back to 2018-19 as a base year, or we had a dividend, low salary, um, high dividend remuneration structure in a closed company, and they, they fell foul of both schools. They were neither self-employed, nor was there a significant salary that could be gone through the, the job retention scheme. So it's likely that, the quid pro quo for there being benefits in terms of grants is that the taxation may be aligned. And I would think with the, the class four national insurance, that's not impossible. Well, what I would say if we're being realistic is look at your profit allocations, um, partnerships, closed companies, how is it matching up with the earning power? Does it look reasonable in these, um, it, you know, in, in this scenario, will you need to bank in the fact that there could be changes there and there might be a slightly increased tax liability. So if we move on from the budget, making tax digital, if you'd asked me 12 months back, I would not be giving you the answer I'm giving you now. The COVID experience has really shown this in highlight. Now I've links to a couple of articles I did there on, on the website. All those are just pictures of a day. Um, I, I think if one wrote them today, one would, one would write them slightly differently. If we write them tomorrow, you'd write them differently again. But the key point is that COVID-19 has shown us the advantage of real-time information. I think that the job retention scheme has been more focused, more immediate, more direct, uh, more targeted. And the self-employed income support scheme 
we're getting distressing stories of people who've fallen out, who, who aren't able to claim, who started up in the last 18 months. Um, there are all sorts of reasons why you, you, might not, you might not claim, you know, you might not be covered in that one. And, and the answer then comes back, well, how could you get in the scheme? And some of that is then coming on to digital tax. If the revenue had had up-to-date quarterly information, would that have brought us a different outcome? So that's one part of it. The next one is, what are the drivers in digital tax? And one has to be the enterprise tax management platform. The revenue is revolutionizing its data. That's not gonna be quick, but that's where we're heading. And that means that everyone else has to go online. Whatever your business circumstances, that the need to, to have the tax data on one platform for the revenue is gonna push it. Treasury cash flow, well, the, the anecdotal story about the 30 days capital gains tax reporting is how to improve, how do we get the money in faster? Ah, oh, well, um, property disposals, why don't we take the money as soon as the property is sold? Similar logic would apply to self-assessment income tax. Um, if you think at the moment, a business is delayed 18, 24 months before it, before it needs to pay the tax, depending on its, its accounting date, that could speed up. And if we move on to the next slide, we'll, we'll give you the, the, the reasons why. The revenue has gone down the strategy of APIs, application program into plans, and that has big consequences. One of it is that they are, if you like, providing the, 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 the socket, but they're not providing the plug. The plug is commercial software. You will need commercial software to access HMRC services. How do you get independent software providers to do that? Well, obviously, as in, in making that suitable for fat, if there is mandation, that gives them a larger market. So we're going to see um, a development, I think, that's going to be piecemeal. It, it might come and go, like with the, 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 the populist sector and the entity for that. There might be a headline broad brush that says everyone's in. And then when we look at the detail, it might be apart from a few people who are out. Another key driver is the error and fraud that's coming out through the um, COVID support schemes. If the revenue had up-to-date information, that would be easier to tackle. So I can see there's going to be um, a, a push towards faster implementation, say for instance, of income tax self-assessment. And if I were you, I would be gearing up your practices so that all your clients were at least moving towards that ability to do um, a quarterly reporting. So at that, I think we're, we're about up to time and I'll, I'll pass back to Susan to, to look at the tax horizon. Right, hello again, everybody. Um, I'm not going to speak for very long about this. Um, really, what I just wanted to do was to highlight um, a paper which the ICAS Tax Board has produced. It's called The Future of Taxation in the UK. And you'll see there's a link on the slide. It's now up on the ICAS website. And I'm hoping that over the next few weeks or so, you might see some publicity about this because this has been, we're hoping to have a sort of campaign where this is going to appear on social media and in the press. And it's also being sent to um, various politicians, so people like the Finance Kit Bill Committee in Westminster and to some of Scottish members of various um, Scottish Parliament committees as well. So do go and have a look at it. The Tax Board has been working on this for some time and basically what, what we've done is taken um, various areas of the UK tax system and we, we've come up, we, we've sort of analysed some of the problems and come up with some recommendations for what we think would be a good way of taking things forward and then we've set out at the end of each section what we think the benefits of adopting our recommendations would be. And I hope you can see that's that's just a list of the areas that we've we've covered in the paper. And I'm hoping I hope you can see that they're well, they're, they're some of the really hot topics in tax at the moment. Um, I particularly like the, the one about improving tax administration. I'm sure if any of you have had any reason to try and look at things like penalties and interest recently, you'll you'll know that it's an absolute nightmare because 
um, it's scattered over various finance. It, you, you'd think it all ought to be in the Taxes Management Act, but it isn't. It's scattered over various different finance acts and everything else. So one of our recommendations there is, look, could we have a consolidation of the Taxes Management Act, bring everything together in one place? And whilst you're doing it, also bring it up to date, because there are so many things in TMA that have not taken account of the digital age. Um, so, and, and in fact, there have been quite a few tribunal cases about whether um, HMRC can do things by computer when, when the legislation talks about officers of the board having, having to do things. So that's quite an interesting section. I'm sure those of you in Scotland will be interested in the one about devolving tax powers across the UK. Um, and as you can see, well, we've also covered the area of income tax, NICs and workers, which is always a contentious one. And, and some of the distortions in the tax system there have really been highlighted by the COVID-19 pandemic and, and the support schemes for the self-employed and the employed empo and employees. So I do recommend that you go and have a look at the paper. And if again, as with some of the other things I've been saying earlier on, if you do have any thoughts on any of this, do drop us an email because we'd be interested to hear your views and now i'll hand back to david thank you very much susan and philip a uh, lot of ground uh, obviously covered there and uh, quite a few questions coming in uh, during during the course of that uh, we are fairly short on time unfortunately uh, we have you know just a few minutes uh, to cover some of those questions so we we just quickly ra uh, go on to, to to some of those and say fairly brief answers and we may need to expand on some of the answers in the q a document that we'll put on the website uh, afterwards but um first one um is one that was actually submitted in advance um so philip perhaps to to, to you and you, you touched upon this in relation to the um the taxability status of of some of the the covid grants uh, etc um and really in, 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 you know we, we talked about the the self-employed income support team uh, being on a separate box on the tax return what about some of the, the the other grants are they likely to be taxable um on the date of receipt or is it um when when they are, are claimed uh, tax years etc what's what's the position with that Right, David, that's a, that's a very nice question. I mean, I think we're, we're still waiting detailed guidance on it, but I think the default is two issues. Has the business ceased? Um, I think if a business has ceased trading and then receives a grant payment after the date they cease trading, we're going to find it's taxed on the date of receipt. Um, if the, the, the business continues to trade, then the normal rules for grants are likely to apply. You know, the tax rule is basically follow generally accepted accounting principles unless there is a specific tax rule that says otherwise. There's no specific tax rule about the other grants that says they have to be taxed in like 2021. That 2021 rule applies only for the self-employed income support scheme. So there's a little bit of flexibility there. What my, my view would be um, look in the business income manual on the section on taxation of grants see how it stacks up because all the conditions on these grants are slightly diff different but but essentially you, you'd be bringing it into account in a normal way and seeing what what would be an appropriate way to deal with it on the normal rules and obviously some of the um the grants are specifically i guess in relation to to things like uh leisure and hospitality sectors where the grant is, I guess, supposed to do, uh, support them through the closure periods. And, you know, there will be a lot of uh, accounting year ends, I suspect, around uh, uh, the end of March, etc. Would that be appropriate then to accrue the grant uh, fully into the, to the March period uh, when the grant was, was, was claimable? Or should it be split and, and, and accrued over, over two accounting periods? Right, uh, and uh, that's, a, that's a very good point. I mean, uh, you know, again, just to, to reiterate, the, the self-employed income support scheme, the answer is clearly we do not accrue for the, for the March period. Um, on those other grants, it, it will depend on the detail of the circumstance, and you're quite right, it's going to be the, 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 the year end that's appropriate. Um, I think one will have to look at the exact nature of the grant, but uh, essentially, it, is, it would seem at this stage, though obviously we're waiting for, for firm guidance, that one would follow the accounting principles that, to, 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 to treat the grant in, in terms of what your tax treatment would follow the accounting treatment. 
And thank you. And I'm, I'm sure there might well be uh, further guidance issued uh, on some of those issues for, for, further down the line. Um, Susan, just, just coming to you briefly, um, uh, there's a question come in through the Q&A in relation to the capital loss restri restrictions. And the question is whether the maximum allowance of £5 million, is that shared between capital gains and trading? Uh, yes, David, it is. Yes, um, it, 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 as it is as it says on the slide, the five million de maximum deductions allowance is shared between the two, and that's unfortunately making the calculations rather more complicated. Um, and it would have been simpler to have a separate deductions allowance for for the two, you know for each of them. And unfortunately, the government chose to say that they're going to share it. So um, I'm afraid that does add some complexity. Okay, thank you. Um, another question in through the Q and A. Um, we've not really touched much on IR35, um, but obviously that was delayed as a result of COVID. Um, the question that's been put is, do you think there's likely to be further delay after April 21 uh, on, on IR35 implementation? Oh, I think it would be a very brave person who speculated as to what might happen on that. Um, and of course, ICAS did give evidence to, to the House of Lords committee that was looking at the extension of IR35. And, and that committee did produce some recommendations, but I don't think I'm going to hazard even a guess as to what might happen. <laughs> Thank you, Susan. Um, and, and, and finally, um, one which we might well uh, return to, but again, in relation to um, the COVID situation, uh, time, to, time to pay arrangements. Philip, you mentioned around VAT yeah. deferrals and self-assessment de deferrals. But I guess you know, one of the other measures was, was generally around uh, time to pay arrangements with uh, HMRC. A uh, couple of questions come in around the same issue, around where time to pay arrangements might have been arranged um, before the CGRS was, was really fully implemented. And the question is, does, does PayYE and NIC um, on, C, on CGRS payments, does that still need to be paid in time? Or is that rolled up as part of uh, time to pay arrangements with HMRC? Right, David. I think what what I would suggest with the the, the, the specific one on the, the CJRS is that we, we take that away and consider it because um, we'll need to look at the detail of and, and they're still implementing some of these rules where it's waiting some further guidance later in the week. Um, in general, and and this would happen with things like R and D credits, um, the revenue is being quite strict that only the COVID deferrals, like the deferral of VAT and the second payment of income tax self assessment. Um, are, are out, out with the, the set-off arrangements and they are normally doing set-off against everything else. So if you, if you owe tax, um, they're expecting it to be paid up, up front, essentially. And if, you, if, you, if they owe you, they will net it off the, the amount that um, even, if you, even if you have a pay-as-you-earn, a, you know, a time-to-pay agreement, they will still net off their refunds against that. So my, my feeling would be for the specific one, we'll take it away and, and just see if they clarify the, the guidance during the week. Thank you very much, Philip. Uh, we are out of time uh, now, unfortunately. So um, as, as Philip has, has mentioned there, we will do a, a, the Q&A document that will um, accompany this webinar and that will be available on icast.com forward slash webinars. Uh, later on after this uh, after this webinar. So as I say, I'm really sorry we've not been able to get through all of the questions uh, just now, but we will put that Q&A document together uh, and make that available for you. Please just remember that uh, you can go keep up to date with all of the latest information, guides and resources through ICAST.com. Um, and that's for all your tax and general practice areas, as well as through the coronavirus hub. CA Connect also has a range of forums to enable you and the fellow members to keep in touch and connected and answer questions uh, throughout the period. You can always continue to access support through the uh, Technical Help Desk, which covers audit and accounting, as well as tax, practice support, AML and ethics. And that's available through the contact us section on ICAS.com. So it really only leaves me to, to thank both uh, Susan and Philip for joining me today and to guide us expertly through the subjects and answer all of these questions. I do hope that the webinar has been helpful to you. 
we do have an, a range of webinars coming up and as I've uh, already mentioned earlier on we will be returning to the job retention scheme and the self-employed income support scheme update in a couple of weeks time um, when there are further guidance being issued uh, we're expecting on the 12th of June uh, so we'll follow that up on the 18th and uh, next week we'll be returning to accounts and auditing issues when I'll be joined by Anna Drain our Head of Sustainability and Corporate and Financial Reporting at ICAS and we'll look during that webinar at going concern and events after the reporting period uh, for small and micro-sized entities. You also still have time to sign up for next Tuesday's ICAS Insights webinar uh, where James Barber, uh, ICAS Director of Policy Leadership, will be joined by Scott Hansen, uh, Principal in Public Policy and Regulation at the International Federation of Accountants, and uh, Trevor Williams, a Professor of Economics and Finance, who uh, I've heard speak many times now um, and really brings the economics down into a very digestible format. Uh, and they'll look at the lasting effects uh, of COVID-19 on the global economy and society. So uh, do please sign up to those webinars and other webinars um, on the ICAS hub, uh, icas.com forward slash webinars. So great uh, for you to join us. Thank you very much for, for, for joining us. Uh, just a reminder, please do give us your feedback on this webinar and any future topics you would like us to, to cover uh, on the questionnaire that co comes up as you end this webinar. Uh, but for now, thank you very much for joining us. And until next week's I Ask ICAS webinar, goodbye. Mm -hmm.